This program is brought to you by SoundsTrue.com. At SoundsTrue.com, you can find hundreds of downloadable audio learning programs, plus books, music, videos, and online courses and events. At SoundsTrue.com, we think of ourselves as a trusted partner on the spiritual journey, offering diverse, in-depth, and life-changing wisdom. SoundsTrue.com. Many voices, one journey. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Dr. Judith Orloff. Judith Orloff is a psychiatrist, an author, and on the UCLA Psychiatric Clinical Faculty. She synthesizes the pearls of traditional medicine with cutting-edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality. Judith is also an empath and specializes in treating empaths and highly sensitive people in her Los Angeles-based private practice. Judith Orloff is a New York Times best-selling author of Emotional Freedom, Positive Energy, The Power of Surrender, and Second Sight. With Sounds True, Judith is the author of a new book called The Empath's Survival Guide. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, Judith and I talked about what makes someone an empath and how the rest of us can learn about empathy from these particularly sensitive people. We also talked about empaths in relationship, empaths at work, and what's it like for men to be empaths. Judith showed us some on-the-spot practices that empaths can use when they're feeling overwhelmed or needing to discharge other people's energy that they've absorbed. And finally, she led us in a heart-breathing meditation for all of us to open our hearts to the gifts of empathy. Here's my conversation with Dr. Judith Orloff. Judith, your new book is called The Empath's Survival Guide. And just to begin, I'd love to know what you think about this situation we're in where there's a part of the population that is trying to develop, if you will, empathic skills. You know, I want to learn how to take the position of the other so that I can be a better collaborator and communicator. I really am going to try to develop more empathic skills. And then we have this other percentage of the population that needs the empath's survival guide. They have so, they're so empathic that they're overwhelmed by their level of empathy. So how do you see that curious situation we're in? Oh, well, I could totally relate to that. I, I'm a psychiatrist and also an empath, and so one of the reasons I wrote this book was to really share what tools that have worked for me and that have saved my life so that I can be a, an empowered empath you know, with other people. But what happens with empaths who are people who are emotional sponges and high up on the empathic spectrum, meaning they they feel kind of maximum. They feel a lot and absorb a lot. And so they tend to get burnt out and overwhelmed and go on sensory overload. Now, as a result, they're going to need tools to deal with their empathy. Otherwise, like a lot of my patients, um, they'll come in with panic attacks, anxiety, depression, or just plain exhaustion from taking on so much from the world. Um, But to me, empathy is the medicine the world needs right now. We need it personally in our relationships, and we need it collectively. And what empathy does is that it allows you to put yourself in someone else's shoes, even if you don't like them, even if you don't agree with them, and to really sense where they're coming from. And why would you want to do that? You'd want to do that because that's your only hope of bridging the gap. It doesn't always work, um, but it's your only hope of of it working and it's your only hope of success. So for that reason, you know, I wrote this book to train people, you know, how to be empathic and be comfortable with it Mm -hmm. and not get burnt out. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like we both need to learn from people who are empaths so we can develop those skills if we don't feel we have them. And we need to help empaths 
handle their empathy. We need to support them. Oh, yes. The empaths need a support, um, you know, desperately. And I have a, an online Facebook community with 7,000 empaths chatting all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's a, a place of kindred spirits. And in the book, I also recommend that people form empath support groups based on the book where they read a section of the book and then they share about where they're at empathically and learn from others because the more seasoned empaths can teach those who are just newbies how to deal with it because you do learn so much along the path. Now, I you know, can share so much with people who are just beginning because I've gone through everything. Yeah. You know, believe me, I mean, I felt everything. And, and every day is, is a meditation on time management, saying no, taking care of myself, learning to be with others, learning to be alone. It's a constant balance of how to do that, but a new empath coming in, it's kind of like somebody who gets sober for the first time. And, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, they just have to learn that life isn't always going to be this tiring or this, you're not going to be sick all the time, you're not going to be anxious all the time. You just have to learn certain skills. And that's why I was so excited about writing this book, because so many empaths are misdiagnosed by traditional medicine. And they get put on all kinds of meds and given all kinds of medical tests that cost lots and lots of money. And rarely does anything really come up that's treatable. But if you take a history, and this is what I'm trying to teach healthcare professionals and everyone who works with others, you have to take a history uh, if somebody is an empath. Uh, You have to ask them, are you extremely sensitive to noise, smells, and excessive talking Do you replenish yourself alone versus with other people? Have you been labeled as, quote, overly sensitive? Um, Do you prefer taking your own car places so that you can leave when you please? Um, Do you suffer from, quote, anxiety from too much togetherness if you're in a relationship? So, you know, these kinds of things are checklists that I think all healthcare professionals should ask their sensitive patients because then they won't be over medicated or put in a psych ward or you know labeled especially children you know children suffer from this enormously sensitive children who are diagnosed and put on Adderall or something like that because they're anxious from their sensitivities so i really want to veer people away from that course if possible to learn very simple productive skills that could make empathy a joy and that's the mm-hmm. whole point you want it to be a joy What's the difference, Judith, between being an empath and just being a highly sensitive person? Oh, great question. I get asked that a lot. There's a spectrum of how empathic people are. There's, on the zero side, are the narcissists and sociopaths who have what's called empathy deficient disorder, meaning they don't have empathy. That's really important for people to get. And then there's, you know, the middle part of the spectrum, which is most people where you're able to feel for others. And then you get up higher on the spectrum, highly sensitive people who have all the sensory elements. They're they're sensitive to sound, noise, smells, talking, like being alone. But they don't, like an empath, absorb people's emotions and physical symptoms into their own bodies. That absorptive tendency goes along with empaths, which are the highest on that spectrum. And also empaths have highly developed intuitive abilities. I have a chapter in the book on intuitive empaths who include earth empaths, plant empaths, animal empaths, dream empaths, mediumship empaths. Now empaths that are very sensitive intuitively and can tune in in a very deep level to you know, many levels of existence. And so highly sensitive people aren't really known for that. But I want to say that you can be an empath, you can be a highly sensitive person and an empath. You can be that, you can kind of vary and go in and out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were first beginning to speak here in this conversation, you said, I'm a psychiatrist and an empath. How did you first identify that you were an empath? Well, I really knew about it as a child, but I didn't have a word for it. And this is why it was so dangerous, because I would go into shopping malls or crowded places 
walk in feeling fine, walk out exhausted, anxious, depressed, or with some ache or pain I didn't have before. And so what happened was I was absorbing whatever in that shopping mall and taking it on in my own body, and I'd go to my parents, who are both physicians, and they'd say, oh, dear, you just don't have a thick enough skin, you know, or, oh, you need to get tougher, where that it wasn't the solution. Now, the solution for empaths isn't to get tougher. It's to learn how to center and ground yourself so you can expand wildly your sensitivities and explore them and enjoy them. But I think as I was developing intuitively and learning how to open up my intuition, you know, I came upon the whole concept of empathy, and it made sense to me that I was an empath, that I was absorbing all this time. And I kind of had to find it out on my own because I never had anybody to guide me, you know, which was very difficult because empaths who are guided, let's say, by grandmothers or mothers who had the abilities, it's a very different story than a child who's alone with it. And I was alone with it. And so, you know, my story that I wrote about in Second Sight, I turned into drugs and got very heavily involved with drugs in the in the late 60s and early 70s to try and squash my abilities because they were just too much for me. And that's why I have a chapter in the book on empaths and addiction. As so many people who are in 12-step programs, you know, if you talk to them, they are empaths who are over-medicating to numb their sensitivities because they were so overwhelmed. Really interesting. And that, that applies to food addiction, sex addiction, shopping addiction, any addiction that many empaths turn to these addictions to numb their sensitivities. And once those kind of addicts realize what they're doing, then it's like a huge aha. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I really learned as I was you know, going through medical school, I was, trained, I was kind of training myself to develop my intuition, and I discovered, aha, uh-huh, this is what I am. I mean, this is the revelation for empaths. Aha, uh-huh, I'm an empath. I never knew what to call it. And nobody ever told me this, but I fit here. This is what I am. And I can't tell you how many emails I've received, you know, with this kind of statement. And it is just such a relief because you finally know what to do. And you learn, you know, you begin to learn the, the tools and start to feel better. I got an email just yesterday from a woman thanking me because now she's a happy and healthy empath. And she gave me all the examples of her work is something that she's really attuned to. She's able to navigate relationships. She has a garden. She has art projects. She just feels very balanced in her body because she was able to put all these tools into action. And so Mm -hmm. that's the goal. I mean, I just want to say for empaths out there who are listening to this, who maybe aren't at that point now, you can get there. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to dig in a little bit more and make sure I understand for someone who's listening, who's like, you know, I'm not sure if I'm a highly sensitive person. I don't like crowds and I'm sensitive to smells and bright lights and, you know, I need certain kind of food. But am I an empath? What would be the telltale sign for that person who's trying to self-assess? Well, for instance, if you're talking to a friend who's very anxious and you were fine before you started talking to the friend and you walk away full of anxious, anxiety and panic, that's an empath. You take it on. You literally take it on. Or you can be with somebody who has, let's say, lower back pain and suddenly your back starts aching, whether you've had back problems or not. And then also if you have on the higher level of the intuitive empath, if you're you know, and have a connection to animals, and you could commune with animals and actually know what's good for them and hear inwardly what they're saying. You're an animal empath. So you have Mm -hmm. those intuitive abilities to connect, you know, Mm -hmm. or you're an earth empath. You can literally feel what's happening in the earth in your own body. I've had patients who are able to feel um, a, a drastic oil spill in their body as as it's happening or before it's happening, you know, the toxicity and the poisoning of the earth. I have some empath patients who can't eat any kind of meat and they have to be vegan because they feel the suffering of the animals in their bodies. 
HSPs don't traditionally do that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that when you were describing this as a range, I could imagine someone having the experience, you know, I, I visit the world of being an empath occasionally, but I don't live there. What, what do you think about that? Um, that's a very rare phenomenon because usually you're either an empath or you're not an empath. Um, you could become less sensitive at times. I know when I went through medical school, and I had to just focus on linear scientific realities, I couldn't even remember my dreams in the morning. And so I became more focused in my head um, and less focused on my empathic self. So in mm -hmm. those kind of extreme situations, that lasted 12 years for me. Mm -hmm. In those kind of extreme situations, you could become less empathic or you could, you could become more. A lot of times when people become pregnant, their empathy just <laughs> blossoms mm -hmm. because they're in communion with another life inside of them. And so it just blossoms. Um, sometimes your empathy can grow. What I've seen with my patients and workshop participants working with people who are devoted on their spiritual path, and year after year they get closer to themselves and they get more and more sensitive, and especially those in yoga who have yoga practice, the more they deepen their practice, the more sensitive they become. And then all of a sudden they're overwhelmed with all this energy that they're absorbing that they never were able to do that before. And so becoming an empath can be part of certain people's evolution, which mm -hmm. is interesting. So the more spiritually open you are, the more empathic you become. It's just very natural. Okay, so absorbing another person's energy or even the energy of the earth or a plant or an animal, how does an empath know this is my own personal inner experience, I feel anxious right now, or this is so-and-so's anxiety after I just had a conversation? How do you sort that out in any given moment with what you're feeling? Well, the quickest way, let's say you're at a party and you're talking to somebody and suddenly you feel really anxious, is to just excuse yourself, go move about 20 feet away, or go to the bathroom. That's always the best thing to do because then it really gets you out and it's a socially acceptable excuse to leave. Um, and then see if you still feel anxious because a lot of times if it's the other person, if you get out of their energy field, you won't feel it anymore. So that's just a quick way. And then for me, if I'm with somebody and suddenly I start taking on their stuff, the first thing I ask myself is, are these my issues? Are they the other person's issues? Or are they both? Which is often the case. And so I have to see whenever I'm triggered, I always ask myself what isn't resolved in myself. Because the more I can work through my issues little by little every day, the less I have the tendency to absorb them. And so that's one of the skills in becoming an empath is really devoting yourself to working on your own stuff. And so when you begin to heal little by little more and more, the less you'll absorb. It's really mm -hmm. fascinating. So there's a self-healing mechanism inherent to healing as an empath. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's the end of the day and you get into bed and you feel like, you know, something, I just don't quite feel right. I don't quite feel like myself. I'm not feeling centered in the way that I want. And you ask, you know, is this feeling, whatever it might be, mine or someone else's or both? What if you don't feel like you're getting a clear answer? It's not clear. Does that ever happen? Where you don't know where all this energy is coming from? Yeah, you don't know. Whatever it is you're feeling, you're not quite sure if it came from someone else, if it's your own material, you ask, but you don't feel like the answer. I mean, I'm curious, I could imagine, and certainly it's true in my own experience as well, that sometimes I don't, I can't sort it out. I don't know. Right. Well, what's useful is to scan the day, to start from beginning to end and just do a kind of an, like you scan a body intuitively up and down. You just put your attention lightly on various parts of the body to get a read on it. The same thing is you can read the day and you can see, you can start with the morning. How was it opening your eyes in the morning? How did you feel? You know, how was it the first person you spoke to? How was it at work? How was it working out? How was it when you came home? Just, you know, quickly scan it to see if you get any blips on the screen there. 
And if mm-hmm. you, you see anything that sticks out or where you're triggered, you could focus on that. It's just a really easy way. And let's say you don't know. You can't find a suspicious person you think you might have absorbed. You go and also do an inventory of who you interacted with each day and how you felt with each person, if you have that awareness. But let's say you can't find out. Let's say that that, can, that worst case scenario, you have no idea. All right, it's more important at that point to center yourself and to reconnect with Tammy or reconnect with Judith you know, and really come to center. I meditate before I go to sleep every night. At least I try to. And I meditate first thing in the morning because after I remember my dreams because I find that's a good way to start out. It's a good way to start out feeling myself and feeling the divine first thing. So I get out of bed, my altar's in my room, my sacred space, and I go right there. And that helps me center myself. Sometimes you might not know where the energy is coming from. It could be coming from the earth. It could be coming from your neighbor, the walls, or if you live in a townhouse or something. You know, sometimes you don't know where it's coming from, but you know you feel thrown off. And that feeling thrown off, for me, is always a signal. All right, start from point one again. Connect to your heart. Connect to yourself. Breathe. Look at the wind. You know, feel the wind. Look up at the moon. Do whatever you know can ground yourself. And, and so that's... You know, that's how I would deal with it. I wouldn't worry too much if you can't figure out where it's coming from. But if you see repetitive patterns, you're around the same person over and over again and you don't feel great around them, that's important to notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, Judith, in the spirit of transparency, I'm going to share that I am married to an empath. I've been with this person for 15 years. And one of the things I'm curious to know from your perspective is for somebody who's partnered with an empath, what do you need to know to really bring out the best in them? Right. Well, the first thing you need to know is that she is going to need a lot of alone time. And and I wouldn't take it personally. You know, if she says, I need to go in my room and be quiet for an hour a day, a weekend, Really accept, try to accept that and take that seriously because she replenishes herself alone. I mean, that, that's important. A lot of non-empaths feel hurt by that because they want to connect and they want to spend the time with them, you know, and, and, and they want all that. And that's totally understandable. But from an empath's point of view, when they're on sensory overload, they need to do things to take care of themselves. So, you know, that's the point of understanding. And sometimes, you know, I know in my relationship, I'm with a guy who is not an empath. And honestly, I really prefer sleeping alone. You know, I prefer sleeping alone, and that's hard for him. You know, because I like to have my own dream time space and not be awoken by little noises or whatever, and so we've compromised on that. What do you do when an empath is living with a non-empath? You know, we've compromised, and he, you know, if he's feeling any back pain or if he, you know, is sniffling, he doesn't stay in bed with me because I, that's really disturbing to me. You know, but to a non-empath and especially a deeper sleeper, maybe that would be, you know, okay because they just drop off into sleep. So it was kind of like the princess and the pea, and I say that lovingly where you can feel the pee underneath 25 mattresses, you know, the Mm -hmm. empath. And so it's a different perception. So number one, I would give her alone time. Um, Number two, I would really listen to what's important to her and so you don't judge her or say something like, I wish you were different. Um, That sounds like good advice. Yeah. Yeah, because she's not different. She is who she is, and this is the person you've chosen to be with, and this is your spiritual teacher. You're being taught by an empath. (laughs) I think that's a beautiful thing, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, as an empath in relationship, 
What have you learned over your decades of love relationships about how to navigate that successfully for yourself? You've mentioned a couple of things, but I'm, I'm wondering what else for the empaths out there who maybe are struggling in different ways with intimacy? Right. Well, I have to say for me in my past, and I write about this in the book, it's been a, it's been a real challenge for me, especially being a writer and being an only child and being very solitary. You know, I wasn't born for relationships. You know, I'm much more comfortable alone in a lot of ways. And so my relationships for years would last maximum two years because I just couldn't stand it at a certain point. I'd go on such sensory overload. I was so uncomfortable with expressing all my empathic needs. If there are many, many needs, I would just bolt. And so I wouldn't really have long-term relationships. I would have lots of time single. You know, I could go a decade single, you know, and I'd always dream of having a soulmate, but I could go a long time single because... On some level, I was more comfortable with that. It's a quite a journey being in a partnership. I've been with my partner now for almost four years, which is a record for me. You know, but the challenge is that empaths face: how do you be a sensitive person in a relationship when your needs may be very different than your partner's? I mean, unless in the book, I have a, a number of scenarios. One is what if an empath is living with an empath? You know, which is one scenario, what if it's an empath is living with, let's say, a rock or somebody who's pretty solid? And that's what, what's happening in my, my scenario. I could never live with another empath. It would drive me insane. Because yeah, tell me, about that. tell me about that, the empath to empath relationship, what that's like. <laughs> well, they're both, they don't have any membranes between themselves and the world, so they're both feeling everything. And so if they're both on sensory overload, both on having anxiety, they could just drive each other over the edge. So what two empaths need to do, you know, because you know, during those times is separate. They need to go in their separate rooms, separate times, learn to bring themselves down before they reconnect again. You know, the, the positive about being in love with an empath, if you are one, is that they get you. You know, they totally get where you're coming from. They understand your emotions. They understand your needs. So you don't have to use code with them. You know, you just, you really, they really understand you. But the downside is that you both can get so overwhelmed that you triple your anxiety. It's like a synergetic effect, which is not good. I mean, I've counseled so many empaths who are living with each other, and it can be done. It's tricky. It can be done, but you, you've got to both separate, you've got to both meditate, you've got to learn how to set boundaries with each other and not be tempted to keep asking questions when somebody is going through an anxiety attack. You, know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't mm-hmm. want to encourage them at all because then you're going to get all fired up. So, mm-hmm. that, you know, it's interesting. This is, that's the challenge of living with an empath. Um, the, the advantage for me of living with a non-empath is that he does not get shaken like I do. I mean, I could, the smallest thing, if I'm feeling an energy, I can just, you know, be affected very, very strongly by something. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I'll, I've i been known as an empath to leave dinners. Because I can't be around a lot of anger. Empaths often have a hard time with yelling, anger, and hostility. And it's not just the normal, I don't, like anger, it's it makes me ill. I re- it you know it feels like bullets are you know being put in my system and being shot at. It's like toxic. You know I can't take it. If I'm at a dinner, let's say, and a couple is the one. This happened one time, and I wrote about it in the book, where one member of the couple was putting the other one down, and they kept doing that over and over, and it kept amping up. And I just left the dinner. You know, I didn't. It wasn't my business to deal with it in order to get involved with why they were doing that. I just didn't want to sit there in that energy. It was too Mm -hmm. painful for me. And so if you're a non-empath, you just kind of sit there and grin and bear it, usually. But for me, I left. You see, so yeah, (laughs) you have to get used to taking care of yourself in the ways that you need to. And so I won't subject myself to energy that is painful to me I mean, unless I have to, if I'm in a situation like with my partner, I'll do it, you know, if we're working through something, but not 
just random people sitting at a table. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Or if I'm in an airport and I'm sitting next to somebody and I'm not comfortable with their energy, I'll just pick up my stuff and leave. Now, I don't mm-hmm. even think about it anymore. But you know, I want to tell you this to give everyone permission to do it. I'm not just telling you my story. It's hard for people because they're so afraid of hurting other people's feelings by leaving, by saying no. And <laughs> actually, when I, I don't leave that, much, that many times during dinner, but the one time I did leave, the woman asked, is it me? <laughs> and actually, it was her. <laughs> so, you know, because she was uh, that particular example was somebody who had, had had too much to drink, and I was really uncomfortable with it, so I just left. And so she asked her friend, was it her? And I said, yeah, it was her. I was uncomfortable with her drinking. So you have to kind of get used to that kind of thing, but it spares you so much angst because what happens to empaths is that they're overly polite. They tend to be people pleasers. They tend to be very nice people, very loving, very intuitive, and they stay in the wrong places too long. They don't have the wherewithal to set the boundaries and say, this doesn't feel right, I'm out of here. So what I'm encouraging people to do in a very loving way is to begin to take action, to take care of yourself. So then you can enjoy your gifts. You want to be an empath and go out in nature and feel the ecstasy of nature. You want to communicate with the plants. You want to be able to feel the universe and, you know, all your abilities to feel the depth of things. You want to play with that. You want to expand that. You don't want to be bogged down by kind of the mundane challenges of being an empath. And by mundane, I don't mean unimportant, but more of the earthly plane, the regular, ordinary reality plane. You want to go to different places. You want to really expand your gifts and love, 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 and really expand the heart and, and play with areas of consciousness that maybe other people don't have that facility. Tell me what you mean by that. How does an empath like you play in areas of uh, accessing expanded consciousness that other people might not be familiar with? Oh, I go out into nature and it's just, you know, I I have no defenses or no boundaries up. I feel, I'm able to feel the plants and I'm able to feel the sky and I'm able to connect to the creatures of the earth and, you know, just feel, you know, it's really like, the Garden of Eden in so many ways on this earth planet that we're on, if you can feel it, you know, you don't want to go out in nature and be talking and be in your head like so many people do. They'll have conversations in nature about whatever. You know, I go to nature as an empath and just open up. And I get filled that way. That's how I fill my body and my soul and to be able to feel spirit um, and, and so to be able to expand, where does that go? What do you feel? I mean, do you get messages in those states? You know, sometimes you know, when I'm sitting meditating next to a tree, I'll be able to get clarity about issues in my life. And so one thing leads to another. Nature leads to intuition, leads to knowing, leads to revelation, leads to, oh, now I know how to deal with this. So your expanded state in nature can stand you in good stead for the other aspects of your life, just simply because you're flowing. And I don't talk a lot in nature. I try and be quiet because then I could feel more in my body. So for me, nature is a playground. And I know for many empaths it is. And and the moon, just last night I saw the beautiful full moon and I just opened my body to it. I looked at it, I felt it, I breathed it in. It's a beautiful thing when you have this kind of openness to really feel in your body the universe. And so anyways, this is how I I play. You know, many empaths have their own form of play. Um, But you can just experiment with so many things. And when you're with other sensitive people who can connect, then having the joint experience is just blissful. When you're with somebody who gets all this, You're listening to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. 
we welcome you to learn more about our collection of more than a thousand learning programs and receive three free gifts just for visiting us. Go to soundstrue.com backslash free. That's soundstrue.com backslash free. And now, back to Insights at the Edge. Now, Judith, I'm imagining someone listening, and the light is going off inside, and they're going, oh, my God, I think I might be an empath. You know, right. I, I'm feeling it as Judith is talking, although I also am having a certain amount of trepidation about, am I going to be overwhelmed? Am I going to be able to ground and center myself in the midst of this very chaotic world and what, however busy that person's life might be? And I know in the book you teach different practical skills. And I'm wondering if you could share with us a grounding skill of some kind for that person who's listening to our conversation right now, that light bulb's going off, but they're afraid of feeling everything they feel, which might include being overwhelmed by how much they feel. Yeah, right. Well, the, I mean, yes and yes. You, they will get overwhelmed and they will learn tools to deal with it. So being overwhelmed is part of the process. I wouldn't put too much charge on it. You know, once you know what to expect, you know, then you'll know how to deal with it. I think people get panicked about being overwhelmed, um, but I would just expect that's part of the journey, and you're going to learn skills to bring that down and, and balance it. And one, a quick skill that I use if I'm with somebody or if there's some toxic energy and I feel like it's getting in my body, I visualize myself as a window and fresh air and wind blowing through my open window and out the other side. So the release comes with the air and the wind just going through the window. I don't have to do anything. It just blows itself away. And that's a very appealing visualization for me where I, you know, can feel that it just it just goes, just let it go in and out. And I I love the, the wind and I love the air element. So it's very appealing to me. And another quick way to dispel negative energy is to breathe. And breathe it out. Don't hold your breath because when you do that, that holds the energy in your body. You don't want to do that. You want to keep breathing. And then another technique that's quick is earthing, where if you just get to some earth somewhere and get barefoot and put your feet there, that really helps because then you can feel the you know, the, the force bringing you down to the earth, and that's what you want to do. When, when you're overwhelmed, you want to ground yourself, and earthing is a very, very powerful way of doing that. And then also when I'm overwhelmed and I'm in the moment of being overwhelmed, I can either excuse myself if it's too much and just go and center myself, which is fine, you know, or I can look at the situation and I can, you know, sense how I could connect to this person's heart. And sometimes it's a challenge for me. You know, I just do it as a challenge to see if it'll work. You know, anything I can do will work with this person. As it, it usually does, not always. Empathy doesn't always work if people are very shut off. You know, they'll do what they're going to do, and no amount of empathy is going to change that. But a lot of times, you know, I'll be in situations where I feel overwhelmed by what's happening, and I don't like the nature of the conversation, and I'll shift it by affirming something in that person. You know, where I'll tune into them, and I'll say, what are some of their good points? And I'll say something like, wow, you know, you've really thought that out. You know, let's say they're giving me some argument I don't agree with. Instead of arguing with them, I'll say, wow, you've got a great intellectual mind. You've really thought that out. I'm really impressed. And so human beings are funny like that. When you say something nice to them, they usually melt. And it's, mm -hmm. a, <laughs> it's a simple truth. Mm -hmm. Now, simple Judith, truth. You, said, you said something interesting when I said, you know, someone, the light could be going on, I'm an empath, and oh my God, I'm, I'm so afraid of being so overwhelmed by everything. And, and you were like, ah, don't put too much on it, being overwhelmed. That's going to happen, yeah. and you're going to develop skills. I thought that was interesting, because here's this big fear, I'm going to be overwhelmed, and you're saying, I'm not even going to put too much on that. No, you can't. It's just part of the process. If you're interested in developing your empathy, 
and you want to go down that path. And if you're getting these ahas from this conversation, and if you're wanting to really, you know, learn how to deal with overwhelm, you have to feel it first before you deal with it. And so to just kind of embrace it as an en- overwhelm as an energy. And so to embrace that as a, your teacher, really, as, instead of an adversary, you don't want to look at it as an adversary that's going to kill you, because um, you're not going to let it. You see, that's the thing about the empath survival guide. It's a survival guide. It's how do you survive these energies that can really bring other people down. Like overwhelm has brought so many people down because it just goes on for so long. But I'm not going to let that happen. Now, if you read this book, you're not going to be overwhelmed all the time. I could guarantee you because I've written about these strategies because I desperately needed them in my own life. And for me to go around overwhelmed all the time, I couldn't do my work. I I couldn't do anything. It would just be too debilitating. And so these are strategies, and there's an enormous number of them that really work. What do you do if you're an empath in relationships? What do you do if you're an empath at work? Should you be a salesperson, for instance? Or sh- should you have a business at home where you can have more downtime? You know, of course, have a business at home. Empaths are notoriously bad in sales and, or, or working in the, in the public. So, you know, you have to know these things. They go re- <laughs> they, many empaths that I've spoken to haven't really thought about this. They just know I'm miserable in my job. What should I do? And a lot of times they're just in the wrong line of work <laughs> for an empath. Now, now, why would an empath be so bad at sales? I mean, you might think, well, you know, someone understands how the other person's feeling. They would know how to sell them something. It would be a good skill to have. Oh, well, yeah, maybe. But what happens in sales is you have to deal with all that inauthentic energy and, you know, all of the, you know, having to deal with the general public, which is a terrible challenge dealing with the public. Um, I've had one patient who worked in, um, like, Costco, one of the big places, you know, that she had to go to, and they had, you know, she was selling things at Costco or helping customer support. And she had to deal with the loud, you know, megaphones and the cash registers and the people and the disgruntled public And Mm -hmm. it's very, very draining. It would cause her to have anxiety attacks that, you know, were not helpful. She shouldn't be working in a store like that that's so big. Empaths don't do well in those kind of stores. And if you're you're in sales in a very unique environment, let's say you have a catered clientele, you know, and you know, kind of know the comfort level of it, it might be a little different. But just general sales, that can be brutal. Mm -hmm. Being in advertising meetings and and company politics. It's just brutal for empaths. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about men who discover that they're empaths and specific challenges that men might face, you know, being that empathic. Yeah, bless all the male empaths. I really, really love all of you. You know, it's just so beautiful to find a man who can embrace his abilities and no, the problem is that men have been, and boys have been labeled as, if you feel you're a sissy, you're a crybaby, you're too soft, you're feminine, you know, if you don't like being on sports teams, what's wrong with you, or competitive sports. So a lot of sensitive boys don't like that at all. They like going out in nature. You know, they love poetry. They love, you know, creating things. They don't like going on football teams. You know, that isn't what an empath likes to do. Um, And empaths, empathic boys and empathic children in general um, can sense things, and they're very aware of of when to be cautious, um, which is great because it stops them from getting in situations that could be harmful. And so it's very different. Empathic boys and children don't like going to these loud movies where the trailers are so loud, the sound reverberates through your body, the bass is just causing pain in the body. (laughs) an empath you see and in boys you say oh i want to leave no get shame for their sensitivities now we're girls it's a little different you know a little better maybe more than a little better but boys just get shamed for being sensitive and so they grew up believing there was something wrong with them unless they've had extraordinary parental modeling where they say hey you this is a gift you know you develop this And, and teachers often shame boys 
And the school system shames boys for being sensitive. You know, and boys who don't like going in the locker room and all that locker room talk, you know. So, you know, sensitive boys have a real challenge growing up. But if they can grow up and not have their sensitivities totally demolished by our society and they begin to mature and to, and get people around them who could support their sensitivities, um, sensitive men are, can be strong men. And I think the the misconception is that sensitive men are overly feminized, you know, where they just take on the feminine energy. And that's not what I'm talking about as the goal. That can happen, but it doesn't have to happen. And that what I'm trying to teach in the book is how to be extremely strong and have a strong masculine side and also have the sensitivities, which is traditionally more related to the feminine side. Mm -hmm. And to find a sensitive, strong man, I mean, wow. I mean, to me, that's the most attractive man. Do you have any sense, Judith, what part of the population as a whole are genuinely empaths? And then what part of that group are men or women? Well, my uh, my empath support group on Facebook is, I would say, 90% women, um, maybe 10% men. And, and the men have often come out and said, well, I, I'm in the group, but I'm reluctant to share. <laughs> so they more listen, and sometimes they'll share. Um, but I, my feeling is, I mean, the statistics are 20% of the population are, are highly sensitive. Uh, it's a result of Elaine Aaron's research. And probably half of the are typically empaths, but I don't believe that that research is true for empaths. I think those are only the identified people. I think when people are educated and learn what is an empath and am I an empath, that there are just millions of them out there. I mean, there's so many people that are contacting me and letting me know that they're an empath all over the place. And one woman in my group was even complaining being an empath has become a trend, and she doesn't want to become part of a trend, you see. So <laughs> it's, I, I just, that's all to say that I think there are a lot more empaths out there than the research has un, unveiled so far. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple times you've mentioned children who are particularly empathic, children as empaths. And, you know, it, it occurred to me, in a way, aren't all children super permeable and absorptive, or are there really some kids that you could say, oh, that child is much, much, much more likely to be an empath? Or aren't all kids permeable and empathic? Um, not really. Uh, uh -huh. I would say <laughs> I think kids are born, each one is born with a specific energy that they come into this life, and a lot of them have innocence. And that innocence makes them more sensitive and more open. And as they grow up, that gets drilled out of them. And so I think many, many children have that sensitivity. But certainly not all. I mean, some children, you know, I, I've been in, you know, in um, the, the area of birth when children are birthed and they come out. I mean, some of them just don't have much sensitivity at all from the get-go. And so I think it's a romanticization, you know, to think every child is sensitive and open, because I don't think that's true. But a lot of them are, and a lot of them are highly sensitive and highly empathic. And I write about the whole indigo children phenomena and what that is in terms of spiritual evolution of the spirits that are coming into the world now who have more empathy and more awareness of global issues. You know, that the child, many children today at a very young age who are the empaths have more awareness of global issues and have strong desire to take care of the earth. It hurts them when they find out that the earth is being damaged. It hurts them in their bodies, and they're able to articulate that. So I think there are levels of empathic children being birthed into the world now that need to be nurtured as very special, gifted children that instead of thinking of gifted children as just intellectually gifted, that it's essential we think of them as empathically gifted, too. Mm -hmm. Now, in the beginning of this conversation, Judith, I talked about how there are some people 
who are trying to develop, if you will, or open up more to standing in someone else's shoes. I really want to learn how to take other people's perspectives. I want to understand what they're feeling. That doesn't come naturally to me. And then we have this other part of the population who are self-identifying as empaths. They're so sensitive. So let's say someone's on the side of wanting to develop more empathic skills. How could an empath teach them? How can they learn from empaths? Well, empaths can share their perceptions with them, what it's like for them to, and I would start with the positives if somebody else is just starting to learn with empathy. You know, what are the positives of tuning in? And just the skill of asking somebody else what they're feeling or how they're doing as opposed to just stating your own views in a conversation. If you're starting out with empathy and you want to develop it, your verbal skills are very important. Now, you have to ask others how they're feeling or what they're or how they're seeing something, because a lot of times nobody ever asks anybody this question. And people love to be asked. They love to be affirmed and understood and listened to. And if you're curious about other people, you could find out, you know, what they're feeling and seeing. The trick is not to judge them when you actually find out what they're, what's in their mind. <laughs> you might not always like it. But you will find out what it is, which I think is good, because then you know, oh, this person believes this. Okay. No, but it, it's important for the sake of clarity to know what's going on in people. You know? And so just in the beginning, ask people how they're feeling. Um, see if you can feel their suffering. It's everybody's suffering. I just want to you know, make sure everybody knows that. Everybody has suffering in them. That's the nature of being human. All right. However, Empath 101 is learning how it's not your job to take their suffering on. You see, that's the problem with empathy, and that's what scares people off with empathy, is that the minute they can feel that suffering in others, they don't want to do that anymore because it hurts too much. You see, but, you know, just in codependency, it comes into play here where it's not your role to take on other people's suffering. It's your role, if you want it to be, if you want to be empathic, to witness someone else's suffering and maybe guide them or just even hold the space for their suffering without you taking it on. See, that's where empaths get into trouble because they're absorbers, where if somebody starts talking about the loss of their loved one who got killed in a car accident... You know, suddenly, and this was the love of their life, you know, I could go on and on, and the empaths on this call would start feeling exhausted, you know, with the the trauma that I would be describing. You see, but you want to be able to listen to somebody as the other. You know, this isn't you. As someone else on their own spiritual path, going through their own journey, experiencing suffering, and what you get from that is that your heart opens as you connect to their hearts, and it's a very healing experience. You see, as opposed to not being empathic and just shutting it off, going, oh, my God, they're starting to tell me their stuff. I can't even stand it. It's too painful, and just shutting off. You know, so there are choices to be made in how you want to relate to people. And the reason I feel so strongly about empathy being the way is because I'm such a big... A lover of the heart energy, and the heart energy is behind everything. I mean, the heart, the energy of unconditional love, the heart energy that you can develop for yourself, and the empathy. Empathy starts with yourself. You have to have empathy for yourself and compassion for yourself, and all of your shortcomings. You've got a million of them. I've got a million of them. You know, just little by little, say, "Honey, it's okay. You're working on it. It's fine." And then to be able to have that same empathy for others. And if you're at all interested in healing, this is how you do it. You don't have to say a word. Somebody could begin to share what their perception is, and let's say you radically disagree with it. You hold the space for them. I mean, that's all. And what people respond to more than what they believe or don't believe is how you respond to them. 
Now, that takes precedence over even the most vehement beliefs because most people are not treated with kindness, believe it or not. This is what they respond to. And so if you know that, you have to be really smart with people. I mean, even if they're, whatever they're doing about defending their point of view, if you can at least allow them to have it, even though there's a part of you that's seething and so disagrees, there's another part of you that might not love them, you know, and not might, might not agree with them, but you can hold that space just to be there for them. And why would you want to do that? Because you're evolving the whole nature of the interaction. Mm-hmm. Now, Judith, I want to pick up on one thing, this idea of having this open-hearted space towards ourselves. And I'm curious if someone's listening who's an empath and has suffered in their life as a result of their empathy and has perhaps turned against themselves in some way, how could you help that person, that empath, open their heart energy, their love, really to accepting themselves? Well, first I would work with them and start with saying it's okay. You know, whatever you've done, however you've turned against yourself. You know, they say, I've smoked cigarettes and I caused my, this is like a dramatic example, I've caused myself to have lung cancer. How can I ever, you know, have empathy for myself? You know, when I did it to me, you know, and, you know, I guess the logical mind would say, yeah, I guess, guess you're right. But the empathic heart doesn't, even think that way for a second. The empathic heart says, sweetheart, you are opening right now. Yes, you've done some things that have been, you know, dangerous to yourself, but you're making a turnaround at this point. And you could start at this point to begin to heal yourself no matter what you've done, really. You know, and, you know, the the film Dead Man Walking, I don't know if you saw that with Susan Sarandon, Because in the end, he's getting, you know, the IV, the lethal IV, and she's looking into his eyes, forgiving him as he's going, and he gets it right at the last minute, you know, in terms of the self-forgiveness. But, well, I mean, these are big examples. I mean, as an empath, that causes rushes of, you know, joy through my body to see somebody who's able to turn it around, you know, even at the last minute. It's never too late to open up your empathy and to develop self-compassion. It doesn't matter what you've done. And I I feel very strongly about that. Um, You can start now, and I work with people of every age, you know, young people, middle-aged, you know, old people, whatever, super old people, you know, who want to turn it around. And for me, it's just so exciting. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, it's your time. Suddenly, you know, it's your time. And to me, this is what living life to the fullest is. You know, to me, these are the priorities, the empathic priorities that mean so much to me. And when people get there on their own and they're ready for it, even if they're on their deathbed, I, you know, just did a a session with somebody who has a potentially very terminal illness and was going in for surgery for it. And she came in the day before the surgery, and she had not awakened any of this in herself until recently. And so, honestly, I don't even know if she made it at this point. I think she did, but I don't know. But the fact, let's say she didn't. Let's say she came to me the day before she was about to make her passage. She made that change. She awakened just in time before she went. And to me, that's exciting. You see, so I look at this empathic awakening, whether you're a full-fledged empath or simply a beautiful person who wants to keep their heart open in the world without burning out. This, to me, is the path of light. It's so easy to close your heart and see the differences between people, you know, and go to war and all that. It's so easy and it's so justified on a certain level, you see, but... To me, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't. I don't want to do that. I, empathy takes you to another level. It might not change all minds. You know, I just want to say that I don't see it as a shotgun solution for everything, but I do see it as being the only hope of changing minds. And so, for that reason, 
know, being an empath, being empathic, being sensitive, learning to interrelate with others in another way that isn't just I push your button and I'm triggered, um, you know, it's really worthwhile. Judith, as an ending note, I know you teach a heart breathing meditation. You might have different variations on it, but I wonder if you could just leave us here in a brief breathing with our heart, because I think so much has been potentially stirred up for people. I think that would be a wonderful way to end, if that's okay with you. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody who's been listening. I feel the the beautiful quality of your attention. Um, And this is a three-minute heart meditation that I discussed in the Empath Survival Guide, and it's one of the tools I use to ground myself when I'm feeling overwhelmed or off-centered or toxic. And it's just three minutes. It's not the type of meditation you do for a much longer time, just three minutes. And so if everybody can close their eyes, take a few deep breaths, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in clarity, breathe out stress, breathe out worry, breathe out tension, breathe in clarity and love, and breathe out anything you'd like to release, and begin to tune in to the rhythm of the breath. And feel yourself getting settled in your chair or wherever you're sitting, just relaxing your body, nowhere to go, nothing to do, nothing to be. The search is over. You've arrived in just the right place. And then begin to focus on your heart chakra, which is just in the middle of the chest, about three inches above the sternum. You might want to put one hand lightly over that area and just focus on the unconditional love in yourself, the merciful, warm, forgiving nature of the heart. You might feel warmth. You might feel rushes. You might feel even coolness. The Taoists call the heart center of the little sun. You might feel radiations and pulsations of warmth or a honey-like feeling or just pure relief when you focus on the heart. And in your mind, you might want to focus on some image that makes you happy or makes you feel love. It could be a sunset a little pony, flowers, the moon. And just hold that awareness as you stay focused on your heart energy. The heart energy is your healing. It's the healing energy of the body, the unconditional love for yourself and everything you've been through and how strong you've been, and how good you've been, and how hard you've tried. These are all beautiful things. You focus on the heart. Just take a big breath and allow that unconditional love to flow from your heart into any parts of your body that it feels like it wants to go to. Allow yourself to be self-soothed by the heart, the healing heart energy, the beginning and end of all things, the most beautiful sensation. It gives you the relief you've been looking for and the centering. All right, take a final deep breath 
and really memorize this feeling of calmness, of love, so you can return here whenever you like. And gently and slowly open up your eyes and come back to the room 100%, 100% of your body, still feeling the energy of the heart as you opened your heart, more centered, clearer, more in your body and ready to face the next moment that comes. Judith, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that beautiful heart meditation. Oh, you're very welcome. I've been speaking with Judith Orloff. She is the author of a beautiful new book called The Empath's Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive People. She is also created with Sounds True, the audio program, Essential Tools for Empaths, a survival guide for sensitive people. Thanks, everyone, for being with us, and thanks for sharing your empathic skills and developing empathic skills. Judith, as you mentioned, it's it's what we need, this uh, flood and increase of empathy in the world. Thank you so much for bringing your empathic gifts to Insights at the Edge. Thank you. You're welcome. SoundsTrue.com, many voices, one journey.